the answer to that uh, for me, when I felt like I could play uh, music and and actually do it as a, as an occupation, you know, I was in uh, living in uh, Saint Augustine, Florida, which is a great little town, and there was a little room called the Milltop Tavern. It's still there, and uh, they had guys singing and playing from one o'clock in the afternoon until till they, they till they would close at night. And um, there was a guy named Don. Oja Dunaway, he's a legend down there, and uh, he would play in the afternoons, and one day I got the hankering, and I just, I'd go over and watch him all day long, and uh, finally my friend said, you got to get up and play one, you know, and I didn't feel like I could, I didn't know how to do it, I hadn't done it enough, but somehow, a couple beers, I got up and I sang a few, and he actually, he actually said I, I was pretty good, and that was enough to get me very excited about it until finally a couple weeks later, maybe a year later, I've lost, you know, this was 20 something years ago. He uh, called me and they offered me a gig and I played a happy hour time, like five to seven o'clock. And when I was done, they said they needed a regular guy every Tuesday and Monday. And uh, I started to do that there. And it was like learning on the job. I had to learn songs like the day I'd go over there, I would be learning a song to fill up the time. And it was all about like playing different songs each time I showed up. So I learned a lot and I realized after a couple of weeks of that that like I'm actually doing it. I'm a guy that is on staff playing music at a place that I, uh, that I, I just want to hang out at. And suddenly I was actually making a little bit of money and I was able to use that money to, to, to live a little and keep learning songs and you know, stay in that town. So that I would say, Don Oja Dunaway in that place gave me essentially like a, a break. He gave me a chance to um, to play songs and listen to great songwriters and learn how to play and sing and eventually write songs of my own. It sounds like you're almost describing a kind of apprenticeship or something. That it was. People don't think of that so much in music. They think of that as in a trade, but... Um... Right. Yeah, it was. It, you know, it really was. It was, like a, it was like a job. Like, I had to show up to weekly, you know, two, three times a week, sometimes four times a week, you know. And it was, yeah. And also part of it was going to see the other people play and you know, learn something and, and be, try to be as good or a little bit better each week because those same guys that I admired that were playing at that place would come and see me play. And I had to, I had to get good really fast, good enough to keep my spot so there was at this, the world-famous Milltop Tower. So there was a little, world, little yeah. healthy competition, healthy but, competition, but more which, like peer, peer uh, support too at the same time. Kind yeah, of. but the, I felt like I came from a sports background, so to me it was a little bit of healthy competition to, yeah. like, you know, be, to be great at it. And uh, I learned a lot, and suddenly I was doing it. I found myself being a guy that was actually making money, and some money, playing music. So that, that I would say that's the answer. Okay. Yeah, the, uh, the other truth of that question, you know, what made you feel like you could play music? What was your break? What made you feel like you could do it? When I first like, got a guitar, I was 19 years old, living in Boston, going to school, going to college. And, uh, you know, I would play at parties really badly, out of tune, terrible. I was very bad at it, but I was just determined to do it. You know, there was a few guys that could play better than me and sing better, but I just nosed right in for some reason. You know, I would never do that now. Back then, I, I had no problem doing that. I just wanted to do it so bad. And one, I was finally convinced. Someone said, there's a bar called O'Brien's, and uh, uh, in the afternoon, if you go over, they'll, they'll pay you like 30 bucks, and you'll get free beer if uh, you go over and play. And I'd never played like a, a gig for real, for money, ever. And I went over really shakily. My friends had to convince me, and I went over, and I knew like four songs, and I had to fill up like an hour and a half. I played uh, one of them twice, which was uh, Carolina in My Mind by James Taylor. I played that twice. There were two guys at the bar, two old men with their backs to me, paying no attention until the final song, which I played terribly out of tune in a shaky voice. One of the guys turned around, looked at me, and I looked at him, and he gave me the finger. <laughs> and at that moment, I thought, I, I can't. I'll never do this again. I, I feel terrible. This is uh, what, a, what a disaster. And immediately after that, the bartender came up to me and he said, well, I'm not going to pay you for today. And I thought, oh, shit, you know, I'm doomed. Uh, but he said, but, uh, but you want a cold beer? I'll give you that. And then as soon as he handed me the beer, I went like, ah, oh, it's the greatest job in the world. So that also was a big break. I knew if I, get, if I could at least get a couple cold beers out of it, I'd keep doing it. So in a way, that bartender taught me a lesson and the guy giving me the finger taught me a lesson and how, how old were you when this when this occurred i was like 19 or 20 20 at best 
I was well, I'm not sure I was wearing pants so long ago. It was like 1961 or something. You know? <laughs> yeah. Um, again, I came from kind of like I was a I was an athlete in high school, so um, I got sort of uh, my my older brother too. M both my brothers were musicians, so I, the, they had played gigs and had bands, you know. So I knew sort of about it, but I came to it late. I didn't start till I was in college playing and singing. I didn't have a guitar until like my, until my first year of college. And right after um, some of the first like couple parties and trying to meet girls uh, with a guitar experiences I had in college, I was I found myself playing almost right away, playing actual uh, you know gigs for, for, for money and drinks. And um, paying my dues, I'll tell you, I got it right away that my brother Chris, my older brother, kind of put it in my head that you, you know, you got to play all kinds of gigs. You know, it doesn't matter. You got to do the gigs, the gig. You got to do it. You got to, you know, show up. And if there's 10 people there, 100 people there, it doesn't matter. And uh, so the kind of the sports ethic, when I found myself living in Florida a couple of years later and I was playing for the tourists, playing cover songs for the tourists, I, I got right into the part where I wanted to know how many places I can work. And on some days, paying my dues, I would move my PA three times on a Saturday to different places. I'd play, I'd start at one place at 11 in the morning, play till one o'clock, then move it to play from like two o'clock to four o'clock and play happy hour or into the night. Like I would literally be moving the streets and, uh, and there were a lot of people down there doing that. So we'd see each other in the streets and it was all about like, how many gigs do you have? It was sort of a healthy competition. Like how, 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 how many gigs did you have? And is it a good day or are there a lot of tourists in town? Are we making money? Are we scrambling in the streets? You know, so, uh, that felt like paying dues, and I moved to towns like Portland, Maine, and Santa Cruz, California, and I played everywhere and anywhere, and I didn't really have songs of my own back then. I remember playing in uh, Portland, Maine, uh, in a place called the Siemens Club, and um, there were a couple guys out in the street, um, and they were, like, uh, making fun of me, you know, while I played inside, because there was a big glass window, and uh, I felt, at least by then, I felt smart enough that I chased them up Congress Avenue and told them, like, well, if you're so smart, you get the gig. So I started early on feeling like you, if you have a gig, there was some, the, the musicians I knew made me feel like that was um, something to be respected, that you that the gig, if you got the gig, at least you had the gig, you showed up and you played. So I took it sort of as a sports challenge to play as much and everywhere as possible on every corner, every place that they'd have me. Mm -hmm. So... Um, and I don't think that's changed. I'm still paying dues, I guess, because it's just, you know, it's, it's evolved, but mm -hmm. it's, it's the same. I'll, um, a gig's a gig, you know, and I fill up little spaces on the calendar, and I go out and I do them as constantly. Mm -hmm. and, uh, paying dues is, it, it takes a long time before you get good at something. Mm -hmm. So I never, I just feel like I'm just getting around to being good at it, you know. I spent most of the years early on feeling nervous as all as shit just to like go play a gig and that was part of the rush and then to get paid for it and have some money in your pocket man I, just, uh, I don't think it's ever going to be better than the first couple of times that that happened to me I'm still chasing that still chasing my tail to feel the way I felt the first couple of times I had a good gig and I got paid for it and people liked it mm -hmm. yeah, so you know if you're on the if you're like playing music out there in the world the more you do it, obviously, the, the better you get at it. If you make up songs, I make up songs. Um, I, if they, when you first do them, oftentimes, you know, you've made up the song, but it, it, it takes playing them out for them to actually uh, evolve into something. They, they change over time. And the, the, that's why I always feel like I constantly, like I never have a, I'm not in a position where like I'm making a record now and then I'm going to tour to support the record. I'm always playing. I'm always out there playing, and I go a lot. I drive around in my car alone. I drive around with uh, my brother and our friends, and we're constantly going somewhere to play music, and the songs get better the more you do them. That seems obvious to me, but um, I, I feel like um, the best idea is to go out and play as much as possible and keep playing, and um, the songs will evolve over time. Um, in front of audiences, rooms and experiences change them. And the more you play, the more of a smart ass you feel like. You know, you're prepared for anything. Uh, your songs are prepared for anything, if that makes sense. The song, you know when that song will work when you've worked it on an audience over and over and over. And that audience can be three drunks or, or 400 people opening up for Lover Boy or whatever, you know, whoever, you lo whoever it is. Um, and how about, yeah. Um, I learned, like, to entertain playing in bars and for, you know, unruly crowds 
<laughs> that were ready to to, uh, to to throttle you if you didn't you know keep them entertained in some way. So um, for me, it was always uh, play a lot of songs in the early days. It was play just constantly play to keep them entertained, never stop. You know, um, but you get sharper the more you do it. You know, I've learned how to like uh, pace a show now. You know, and that took years uh, of how to like get it so that I can talk to the people and bring them in and get them on my side and read the room and play the room. Play the room meaning like don't have anything planned. You know, go you, into the place with an open mind and then sort of react to what they're, what's happening in front of you. You know, uh, what what people feel like on that day because you never know what you're going to get. You might have a room full of bikers uh, who suddenly want to hear songs about their mom. You know, you just never know. Want to drink whiskey and cry. Or you might have a room full of uh, uh, rich uh, dilettantes who want to, you know, want to boogie down all night long to you know to, to dance songs you don't know what you got so you have to find you have to play the room um, if you're smart and you you do it enough you'll you'll figure out how to do it and repetition is really what it takes it's repetition over you got to have a stomach for repetition if you want to do this because you got to keep it doing it so much because it takes years to to get it it, it takes forever I'm still chasing that also because it's something I, uh, I feel like you have to play every kind of gig, too. I don't say no to almost any kind of gig these days, as you know, because uh, I want to keep my hands sharp. You know, I want to keep my, my skills sharp on that and be able to, to uh, you know, when, when, you know, Livingston Taylor, the great songwriter, always talks about when called, be prepared. You know, because when you're called, you're, you got to be ready. And I think it's uh, doing it a lot prepares you to be called for those moments when you, you need to go into the well and come up with something great, you know, so. I've decided uh, that there is no way to sell out. <laughs> you know, there, it's not possible because what, what does that mean? You know, some idea of what you think you are? I mean, again, I think you, you're supposed to play music for people to feel something or and to have some fun maybe or uh, it's supposed to take people to another place, forget your troubles, you know, get happy and all that stuff. So what does that mean, selling out? To me, <laughs> it, it's like songs are songs. A good song is a good song. And how you play a good song is, doesn't matter if it's Brown Eyed Girl, Margaritaville, or something you made up. I mean, shit, I'd like to write a song as good as Brown Eyed Girl or Margaritaville. They're good, they're, they're, they're popular songs for a reason, you know? <laughs> they didn't just get that way, uh, you know, they're good, they were good. They hit. They did something right. So um, I don't know that there's a way to sell out. I think the only way to sell out is to not defend the thing where you are having fun. If you're not having fun, then and you're doing something that you're not enjoying, like playing a song that you hate and you hate the gig and you hate the people, then you shouldn't do it. Because in the end, I've rectified after many, many years that it's it's all music and it's okay. And some nights in a bar, you play a million old songs. But I loved those songs when I was growing up, just like everybody else. So what? You know, what does that mean? I don't think there's a way to sell out anymore. That's my point. I'm not the Beatles. I'm not putting my songs into car commercials. I'm just happy when people are having fun. And if they if they like some of my songs, and on some nights it's all about my songs, and some nights it's all about the, the great songs of the Eagles. You know, so both nights are equally, can be equally as satisfying. I've stopped um, debating about what uh, which one's more important. Because in a way, uh, I think they're all pretty important. And it's, you know... It's pretty lucky to have any kind of gig at all. So, uh, uh, nope, put me down for, there's no such thing as selling out okay. around here. So maybe like a, maybe a 19 year old kid with his band in his basement has some idea of like, uh, you know, what they are and how they can't sell out and all that stuff. But I, I, you know, when someone says to me like, I would want to write like a pop song, you know, that's, that's not what I write. I write more important songs, you know, and I think, well, you know, it's okay to write a pop song. Get get like some people to love you, to, you know, so you can play them all the other stuff. You know, a lot of it's infiltrating through the back door. You know, if you can write a song that everybody's crazy about and they want to hear it over and over, well, at least they're there to hear you. So again, I don't. Uh, I'd love to be in a position. I'd love to have that moment where I'm like, oh, they only want to hear that song, my hit song. Oh, it's so hard for me. I'd love to have. I'd love to be that guy. So I. And when that time comes, find me. I'll be living at the Fountain Blue in Miami, <laughs> collecting the checks, and 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 you know, bitching everybody about how hard my life is. Uh, not really. <laughs> I won't. I'll be happy. Yeah. I don't care if people are there. Um, I don't think there's a way to sell out. I really stand by that. I, I think you should be happy that um, there's an audience 
There's a lot of competition in the world for your people's attention, and if you can make up a song that everyone can sing along, then fuck it. Yeah, more power to you. Yeah, all right. The business of it. If you're really going to do it, if you're really going to be someone that wants to play music, people that are like, I want to play music for a living and give up my job. Well, it's a business. It is a business, you know. It's there's, there's a couple aspects to it being a business. It's, it's um, you have to work with other people. You have to actually do it. You have to, like, you know, book gigs or uh, go to a place. They're all profit-driven uh, places that want to, everybody wants to at least break even, you know. So you have to rectify that, like, it's definitely, I agree with uh, something you were saying earlier. It's not all, it's not necessarily all about you. Um, it's sort of uh, a bigger idea. Uh, within that context of that, once you rectify that, if there's 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 a business aspect, there's a sort of a niche market that you're working in. You're providing a service in a way, and you have to be a pro guy. You got to show up on time and um, you know do the gig and play the the room they've asked you to play, whether it's opening for um, you know uh, some big name or playing in the corner of a bar. You got to do what you were hired to do. Within that exists art, you know uh, the the to be great at it and to make move people and all that stuff is in within that part. But if you're gonna do it out in the world, if you're gonna bring your songs to the marketplace and all that stuff, you've gotta like actually go out and do it. Which means you know having to respect the fact that it's um, people aren't just gonna love you because you're so great. Sometimes it's also they love you because boy he's a pro. He he or she shows up on time and they're they're good at it and they they um, they were they did a good job and uh, I want them back. That's part of your ability to go out and operate and navigate uh, through the world as a musician is the ability to keep coming back to places and, and build your audience and all that stuff because you weren't a total rube, you know? You tried hard and you, um, you did the best job you could um, uh, and uh, you, didn't, you didn't complain or bitch even when sometimes it felt unfair or unjust. Or, you know, and if you didn't feel like the gig was right for you, you just take it down the road. That's the beauty of it, you know. You don't, you you work for yourself ultimately, but you're contracted to work for other people in the context and the big umbrella of everybody's trying to. Uh, you know, everybody has a reason for doing it. People want to make money. They want to bring people into their place. You want to sell tickets. You want to sell dinners. You want to sell beer, and all that's completely valid. Um, I think a lot of times. Musicians talk themselves out of great gigs and good experiences because um, they lost sight of the part where it's, um, it, you know, where you perform music sometimes exists in the uh, vacuum of, uh, of the dollar. And that's okay. That's all right. Just find a way, be, be a real smart ass and find a way to navigate uh, within that context and you'll be, you'll be all right. So, um, mm -hmm. <laughs> the real truth about like the business of it also is there's the real technicalities in which is like don't be someone that shows when you show up if you were guaranteed uh, you know um, a free one free meal and six drinks don't be someone that during <laughs> the time where they're busy is trying to sell dinners demands your meal and uh, um, get in the way of the actual business of the venue the, a part of it is also you know work in the shadows enough and at, especially when it's your first time there show up and be great and then the balance of power shifts, and the, and when you come back, the waiters and waitresses who are the first people you need to get on your side uh, will be glad to see you, and and um, you know you won't be someone that they, is known for conflict or just for getting in the way, because they actually everybody has to work while they're there, you know whether it be the manager or the waiters or waitresses or anybody. So um, really, the smart move is to uh, is to just. Be polite and do your gig first and worry about all the things you're supposed to get and the details and everything else after. And always uh, say something nice about the place because somebody's heart and soul is in the venue. So that's an important thing too. That's yep. the, which is what do I see, uh, what I hope for myself um, in the future uh, as far as playing music. And to me, it's very simple. I, I, I would like to continue to be someone that is uh, able to write songs and make them into records uh, that um, there's, you know, uh, an interest in enough that I can go out and play and see as many places and play for as many, you know, um, little audiences as possible. I don't labor under the delusion that um, uh, there's going to be some moments going to come along and uh, make it 
make it better. Like suddenly uh, everything will get easier. The hotels will get better and the gigs will get better. And uh, I don't. Um, I would like just to have the opportunity to continue to do it. Um, it's hard enough. Uh, it's hard enough um, out there. So uh, just doing it is enough for me. Filling up the little squares on the calendar, you know, uh, with dates, that's, that, that still excites me. Um, having, having places to go play and being able to do it, that's, that still works for me. That still gets me going. Which, and if you're out there playing, that means you're, it's time to write more songs. And, it's, and if you're writing more songs, it's probably time to, to, uh, to, to put them down on some sort of information disc or something. And, and people will want, there'll always be a little uh, world for that, I hope. So I'd like to sort of continue to just play. So that's, that's pretty simple, I'm sure. You know, only a fool would say they didn't want to, but that's all it is to me. I have no other grand design. Just wanna, um, for, for musicians in, the, in general, just yeah, like in what, general, what, per what performing live, yeah. I, I think the, I don't know anything about the music business. I don't, I'm not really in the music business, like of selling records and MTV and all that stuff. I don't, I don't even uh, barely care about it. Um, I think there'll always be a place for songs. Uh, good songs will always have a little audience. Uh, you can always find your, uh, essentially, uh, uh, a small niche, people that will care about gathering to hear songs. I think for the singer-songwriter type, of person, um, it's the world out there is going to be peppered with a life of house concerts, uh, small corners, and the occasional, you know, um, you know, uh, bigger audiences that care about this particular kind of expression. Uh, other than that, um, I don't think that's going to change. I think no matter how much the world advances itself through technology or the ability to do it, I think there's always going to be a way to gather and and sing songs in the live context. You know. Um, as far as how records and things like that, how music will be transferred, I don't, I don't know anything about that. And frankly, I don't even, it, it doesn't even matter to me. I don't care. As long as there's always going to be a way to make and purvey music for an audience that wants to feel something. That that's, will always be there, I think. Always. Very great. They're coming. Uh, I just think that the idea that um, there's, no, uh, <laughs> there's no computer program or technological solution Rat bastards, get off my lawn. Uh, there's no, um, you know, people are always, in the end, I think it'll actually come around again because the real experience of gathering your friends up and sitting down in, in, in smaller groups and actually singing songs and, and having that give and take between the song singer and the, and the, uh, the listener is never going to go out of style. And I think the more the world advances in a, in a technological sense, the more that that will become... Uh, a vibrant and exciting uh, way to spend a night because there's something about it that cannot be replaced by technology and you see it in house concerts all over the country all over the place people do it um, you know just just sitting around in a circle and passing around a guitar is still a thing that'll just never go out of style you, you're, you're, you're not going to design something to, to, to make that obsolete so don't even try alright good